This is Anthony Nayagan. Welcome. Last week we spoke about formlessness in a series of videos I'm doing um, about mindfulness in meditation. And in that we spoke last week about formlessness. Now, let's think about it. With all the choices God has at his disposal, he chooses to remain formless. Holy Spirit is formless. Jesus says to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection, Don't hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to my Father. That is John 20, 17. It means, don't hold on to my form by way of me, Ascending to my Father in heaven, I will also become formless. Hold on to my formlessness. So what is formlessness? See, formlessness is a field of pure conscious energy in which there is no material entanglements whatsoever. It is free of any desires, free of Advaitic knowledge, and it is the purest oneness of being. So why formlessness so difficult to comprehend? See, let's talk about Western philosophy of materialism and Eastern philosophy of non-materialism. Well, actually, even in the East, you know, non-materialism does not exist anymore. Um, all of these countries in the East, uh, from India to Japan, um, they are very modernized. They are global competitors in economy, education, and pretty much everything. So materialism ever since the occupation and war in Asia has changed quite a bit. You know, so even though the philosophy, the ancient philosophy is still there, but the implementation of this philosophy no longer exists, whether in India or China or Japan, or wherever, it doesn't. So what is materialism in this philosophical context? See, in this materialism does not mean the acquisition of wealth. It is a philosophy in which how matters are connected and related to one another. How particles are connected and related and interact with one another. How theories are defined and made modular. And how these theoretical modules are connected, related and interact with each other. how operations are defined and made modular and how these operational modules are connected, related and interact with one another in an operating system or an operational system within a company. How policies are defined and made modular and how these policy modules are 
connected, related and interact with one another as in an administrative system, whether in a legal system, political system, in businesses, you know, or even in religion. Administrative systems and how they are organized, structured in a material order. How thought processes are defined, made modular, and how our thought processes are connected, related, and interact with one another as ordered perceptions. So it's not just philosophy. It is philosophy applied throughout the systems mainly in the West, but it is in the rest of the world also. I'll give you an example how this is organized and how this is structured. See, health is a formless, abstract phenomenon and it is a state of being. So, How do we determine if someone is healthy or not? We run diagnostics. In our diagnostics, we observe particles. How the particles behave in a sample in a certain experiment. Whether it is a diagnostic experiment, x-ray or scanning, we are observing particle behaviors. We interpret these particle behavior in numbers. See how the orders are sitting in. The resulting number in the observation determines the health. So, not humans as a state of being, but as a state of condition, a related condition. And this state of condition is treated as necessary. That's what healthcare management is. Whereas in Eastern traditional medicine, Health is diagnosed as a state of being. Diagnosis does not involve tissue samples or laboratories, x-rays or scanners or anything that requires an experiment or analysis. They observe the patient's breathing patterns, skin conditions, color of their eyes, And sometimes they would touch the patient, especially if the state of being is affected or suffering from a skin condition or a bone related ailment. Most of the time, they don't even listen to the complaints of a patient. Medicine men and women known as Siddhars observe the state of being of a patient. They seek the intervention of God or Guru to reveal to them the patient's state of being. See, for instance, in Ayurveda, which is a traditional medicine, They observe the breath. See, the breath has about five different constituents. Breakups. One is prana. Prana is the actual breath that is coming in. Then apana. Then samana, udana, vyana. These are all breaths as the breath itself 
enters into different parts of our body and how our body is responding to the breath. And this is what is observed in a state of being in Ayurveda. In other words, see the diagnoses in Eastern traditional medicines involve observing the energy of a patient, whereas Western schools of medicine, diagnosis requires the analysis of particles. This is the difference between Eastern and Western school of philosophy. Western philosophy is particle oriented. Eastern philosophy is energy oriented, particle oriented. Therefore, it is the analysis of matter and the behavior of matters. Energy oriented, thus the observation of breath, the observation of conscious energy. That's the difference. Now, don't get carried away. See, even in India nowadays, the, these kind of things, it, it really is, doesn't exist anymore. Um, Ayurveda and Siddha medicine and all of that nowadays have become much more materialized and uh, and and it's offering quick fixes uh, to conditions not energies but there are some practitioners in ashrams and all of that they really don't care for money or making money or anything like that they, they, they hold on to the tradition and continue to treat them. But this is a, uh, a vanishing practice um, in India itself. Let's shift focus a little bit. See, when we are looking at quantum physics, that is modern theoretical physics, theoretical physics have identified quantum fields that encapsulates a particle in the form of a conscious energy. But the theoretical physics is still obsessed with studying the material aspects of a particle with less relevance to the conscious energy that influences every behavior of the particle. Whether it is Eastern philosophy or Western philosophy, the behavior of conscious energy is ignored. It is an ignored territory of exploration. See, regular energy can be easily studied with particle behavior. How about the energy that has consciousness or rather intelligence of its own? See, many things in life we take for granted are not particles, but in the form of conscious energy. Our life is a conscious energy. Our breath is a conscious energy. Our soul is a conscious energy. Our health is a conscious energy. Our God is conscious energy. Our intelligence is conscious energy. Our mind is conscious energy. It is not a particle. It's not an organ. It's a conscious energy. The beauty around us, the air, we breathe, the sky we look up to, human emotions, all of these are conscious energies. We put too much emphasis 
into understanding this phenomena in a material order. See, we want theories, analysis, definitions and a polarized order so that we would relate to these according to our ordered perceptions. See, let's take for instance a human emotion such as love. How do we understand love? We want to break it down and define the fragments as in Eros, Philia, Ludus, Agape, Pragma. <laughs> there, there are a number of them. We want to fragment them and define each fragment. Then we invent relativities and connectivities among them. You know, how does agape love connects, relates, interacts with another love called, let's say, philia. So there are so much analysis it goes into something that is so abstract, so conscious, so free. Thus, love is evolving in our lives, not as a conscious awareness of a phenomenal emotion, even that of God. It has become a commodity, it has become transactional. We put too much emphasis on the relativities and connectivities and interactions and we express them more in a transactional order than the way it is meant to be. So are the several abstract and infinite phenomena we take for granted. See, the polarized human intelligence, even at genius levels, is not as deep as we think it is. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 3.19 In fact, compared to God's wisdom, human intelligence is shallow and leads to chaos according to the Bible. The knowledge of good and evil will lead you to death. Death does not mean literal death, but it chaos indefinite chaos. Therefore, realization of formlessness cannot be comprehended as enlightening or nirvana by human mind. It requires a transcendent mind void of polarity-based perceptions. Such realizations require a mind that sees everything beyond finite objectifying, but as a manifestation of infinite reality. A mind that is so abstract, orders have no relevance in what it witnesses. A mind that does not have any desires, even the desire of an encounter with God. A mind that is free of perceptions, that it never attempts to fragment and create orders from its observations.
your mind of nothingness. You might ask whether such mind is possible. Absolutely it is. See, it is like observing a dream. Mind does not control dreams. Mind does not interpret dreams as the dreams are happening. Mind only observes the dreams without engagement. It is to such minds, divine emotions, the kingdom of God and the divine will are communicated and revealed. That is what spirituality is. That is what Nirvana is. So it is to such minds Divine emotions, kingdom of God and the divine will are communicated. Apparitions and encounters are normal to such minds. See, Jesus says that in, at one instance in John 5.19, the son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees as the Father is doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Jesus is not trying to stand out as an exception here. Jesus is trying to tell Peter, Peter, you can do the same. Or in fact, it is to Philip. Philip, you can do the same. You can see what the Father is doing. And you can do exactly what he does, like I do. And that is the power of nothingness. A mind of nothingness. See, mindfulness will never get us here. Only the mind that has transcended mindfulness and evolved as mindlessness can get us there. How do we attain mindlessness? This is what we are going to continue to discuss in our next video next Sunday. This is Anthony Nyagan. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you.